Welcome to Your Family Dog, a podcast dedicated to helping families love living with dogs. Here are your hosts, Julie Fudge-Smith and Colleen Pilar. Hi, welcome to Your Family Dog. Julie and I are very excited today. We have a guest, Dr. Leslie Sin, a board-certified veterinary behaviorist who's also a dog trainer, and she's here today to talk to us about uh, particularly electronic training methods that sometimes use quite a bit of punishment. So to start with, Dr. Sin, can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a board-certified veterinary behaviorist versus just a regular general practice vet? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me today in your at your program. Um, a veterinary behaviorist is actually a veterinarian who has completed at least three to four years of additional studies um, that involve uh, things like psychopharmacology, uh, learning theory, uh, neurology, physiology, all the good brain neuroscience stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And that also require the completion of uh, of research uh, projects, uh, publications, and the passing of of a national uh, normed examination to document credentials. So it's a pretty big deal. It's kind of like going to your um, uh, orthopedist or to your psychiatrist on the human medicine side. Yes. There aren't that many veterinary behaviors, are there? Like, no, no, they're 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 not. Um, I think there's something like 53 or something like that. There's really not very many at all. Correct. So in uh, in, in between uh, Australia, Canada, and the United States, we have a grand total of uh, about 70 uh, board certified wow. veterinarians. Wow. 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 Well, then I guess we're lucky in this area to have you so close. Well, not Ju- Julie has veterinary behaviors in her area, but I do. Dr. Sin I do. does the Northern Virginia region where I am. So, yes, I always feel very lucky to have Dr. Megan Heron at OSU, and uh, and yep. she's got an intern right now, um, Leanne Lilly, who's going to be coming on and talking to us about puppy development, and I think we have one up in Cleveland, so we are very fortunate here in Ohio to have as many as we do, but... Um, when I when I have a serious behavior problem, what I usually tell people is we're going to OSU now because they really know what they're doing. <laughs> so I'm very yeah. excited to have Megan here. One for sure. Yes, and she's a real she's a real sweetheart. Um, we've shared several clients, and I I really enjoy working with her. Um, although I always kind of feel bad that I have to go to her because I have a dog with a serious behavior problem, but I always <laughs> like working with her. So it's sort of this you know love hate relationship with Dr. Heron. Um, well, I mean, that's what we're here, right? That's that's what we're supposed to do. We signed on for the job, so I'm sure I'm sure she's happy to see you. <laughs> yes. Well, we do have a good time. Um, but be that as it may, um, my question for you is, um, I think that there has been a real increase in the use of shock collars and electric fences and really intense forms of punishment that comes with using electric shock. And I was wondering if you felt that same way and what you think, where did this come from? Why are we suddenly inundated with shocking our dogs? So unfortunately, this is the problem that won't die, right? It won't go away. Um, And I would agree with you that it, it almost feels like there's been a resurgence. And I, I, in our area, at least, I blame it on two things. Um, Without naming names specifically, let's just say that there has been an upsurge in in franchise-based dog training companies. And and that those franchises tend to push uh, the quick and easy, quote-unquote, solution, right? The the, 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 the training in a box methodology, mm-hmm. which often mm-hmm. um, amazingly uh, consists of providing, you know, the average homeowner with a shock collar uh, mm-hmm. as part of the training package, just, just from the get go. Um, and that, that is, is one source of that increase. And then as Colleen can tell you here in the Northern Virginia area, we have a lot of upscale uh, neighborhoods with very, very strict homeowner association Mm -hmm. rules and regulations. And many of those homeowners uh, associations will not allow the establishment of traditional fences. 
and right. therefore, um, oh, dog owners are installing uh, the invisible type fences because that's the only thing that they're allowed to install. So again, uh, with because of outside circumstances, we're starting to see an increase in, in that um, method of confinement. Yes, and I would say that's a that's a common problem here in, in Ohio too. In fact, in in my own little community, there is um, a, a a sub or I guess a subdivision. Yeah, that that's it. That's how you contain your dog, yeah. and um, it's really unfortunate uh, because I what I don't think most people understand is that there are, can be very serious consequences to the use of, of shock to your dog, and that. I think if they would take a step back and realize that for many years, shock was the standard by which psychological studies were done to evoke pain and anxiety in animals so it could be studied. Right. And suddenly mm-hmm. we're using right. it as a training method. Um, I found that just mentioning that to people tends to make them stop short. And I think that people also understand that there's something amiss here because it's always sort of said with, well, we didn't really want to, but we had to. There's but, sort of, right. There's a certain right. amount of... And like, that it's not choice. that bad. It's just like the static shock you'd get from, you know, touching something in the winter. And I'm like, yes, but I avoid touching things in the winter because <laughs> of that little static shock. You know, <laughs> that's right. It's still aversive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it is still an aversive. And yeah. it's very difficult to tell exactly how adversive it's going to be to any given individual. What may not be that adversive to you could be terrifying to me. I am think of spiders. I mean, I'm not, my daughters won't go within like, you know, 50 yards of spiders and I can kill them without a problem. So, you know, it, just right. a lot of it is, is what is your own sensitivity. So would you well, like to talk a little bit about, about the, uh, I was gonna say, why don't we talk about the compa- containment systems first, because that's okay. actually, uh, actually an easier thing to 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 address in the sense that I think a lot of people go to go to those electronic containment systems um, one because of, of certain limitations from HOAs but also because I mean let's be frank it's cheaper mm-hmm, <laughs> it's it cheaper than building building a fence I just mm-hmm. I just installed a secure fence from my border collie that encompasses a fair amount of, of acreage because they're very active dogs and and the fence alone, not counting the decking, was close to seven thousand dollars, and and that, that's a chunk of change. But that in is. order to be able to secure a secure fence, that is what you have to do. That is what's required. So a lot of people go with the lower cost option. I understand that, but it's it's not secure and it's not safe. Um, Megan Heron, in fact, from the Ohio State that's University, that's right. you said it right. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did a, did a study actually in the past uh, year and a half, maybe two years, where they went and they looked at, at containment systems and specifically uh, compared, um, you know, a, a fixed fence versus a tether versus an electronic containment system. And they also looked at the percentage or the degree of aggressive behavior in those dogs' um, contained within those various containment systems. So one of the surprises of the studies was that they did not see a difference in the level of aggression um, between those three different methods of restraint. Because there's been a lot of just debate about dogs being on tether, being more aggressive, dogs being behind a visible fence, supposedly being more aggressive. They didn't find that. <laughs> but this is what they did find, which, which should worry all of us. And that is that um, electronic containment systems failed almost 50% of the time. In other words, wow. dogs broke wow. out of those containment systems. 44, I guess 44%, 47% was the percentage that they that they found. They don't work. Wow. They don't work. And not only do they not contain the dog within the fence, people have to realize that um, that other people, kids, dogs can come through the fence, mm-hmm. right? It's not just the dog mm-hmm. getting out, it's people coming in. So they are really, um, they are really bogus in terms of, of, of functioning as a, an effective containment system. And, and really, um, and we shouldn't, because of that, we shouldn't be using them. I mean, if, if nothing else, right, they don't work. Right. So, we were so at, my, at my nephew's the, house in the summer, mm-hmm. and he lives next door to a family that has 
uh, an invisible fence and we're playing outside with the children and the ball went in the yard and he was like, oh, they get so mad when we go in the yard to get our ball because of their dogs. And it's just ridiculous. And so he just stomps into the yard to get the ball. And I'm like, oh. maybe because their dogs might have an issue with you being in their yard and that they'll be in trouble if some sort of incident happens in their yard when you come in their yard to get your ball. And he just could not see my point at all. He was like, you know, the ball goes in there. Yeah, yep, it does. <laughs> maybe yeah. that means perfect, you're going to have to go to their front door. <laughs> yeah. yep. Perfect example. Yeah. yeah, there you go. So, well, the other- so yeah. Don't do it. Don't use them. <laughs> no, don't use them. And, you know, and the other thing is, is if you have a, a shy or reticent dog who's now stuck in your yard and you have a, a bully dog in the neighborhood, there's no protecting your dog. There's no protecting your dog. Exactly. And the other thing is I find with containment systems such as the, the, the invisible fence is it makes for um, lazy owners because they're no longer out with their dog. And um, at least if you have a physical fence, you have some kind of a barrier between your dog and something else. But I find I can drive through the subdivision, and I know these people are gone for the day, and their dogs are going in and out of the house without any kind of supervision. Uh, uh. And that's yep. very scary to me as well, um, because what if your dog takes off? And then he's not going to come you know, and sit politely by the edge of the invisible fence waiting for you to come home and turn the fence off so I can come home. Um, there's, a uh, there's all kinds of, I think, really serious ramifications just to your dog getting out. Um, but right. there, and the other thing I find frustrating with many of these systems is that they don't, the installers are not particularly forthcoming with the owners about what might happen to your dog or what some of the consequences are of, of having an invisible fence. And so, um, including serious behavior consequences. So I was kind of hoping you would discuss a little bit about some of the serious behavior consequences you see from these containment systems. So that one of the most, uh, I've had to treat several cases, um, well, more than several, cases of dogs that uh, won't go outside to eliminate anymore mm-hmm. because of the invisible, of the invisible mm-hmm. fence. At some point or another, they've they've been shocked and they generalize that fear and that worry with the entire backyard area. And now they're house soiling inside because they're too scared to go outside. Um, Uh And it may be exiting the house itself or frequently it manifests itself with the dog urinating and defecating on the deck because it's afraid to step Mm -hmm. off of the deck uh, in order to be able to eliminate. So that would be a prime, a prime example of exactly what you were talking about. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And, and often I, the yeah, owner so has no idea when or if the dog was shocked in the yard. You know, like, like, well, yeah, we have the fence, but, I mean, he always stays away from there. I'm like, he's not getting off the deck. He's been shocked. Right. <laughs> There's our clue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I had a client exactly. just this week who said that their, their sensitive dog, they put the collar on him, one shock, and for, it took them over a year to get him mm-hmm. to go out the back door. I had another mm-hmm. client yep. whose dog refused to go out the front door into the yard, and they they used to have, so they had to put him in the car, like pull the car in the garage, put the dog in the car, back the car out, so that we could yes. park on the street, so then we could go for a walk, because yes. uh, it was just and this and this poor dog would just look at his front yard that he used to love, mm-hmm. and just shudder, and just heartbreaking. Yeah. It is. It's absolutely yep. heartbreaking, and I think the other thing that that people don't understand. And correct me if I'm wrong in this, but my understanding of the physiology of this kind of a shock system is that once the the neurons have experienced this kind of trauma, for lack of a better term, um, even if you counter a condition to that and to the shock and the tone, the neurons never go back to where they were before this occurred. So if you have um, punished the dog in this way, and especially if you associate a tone with this punishment, that the tone itself will elicit the same sort of physiological response the dog had to the shock, and that you can never retrain those nerves to calm back down. Is that correct? Uh, they certainly, you certainly can classically condition them to, to other stimuli. So, for example, they use a tone as a quote-unquote warning um, marker 
but the physiologic response is the same. Um, and and where we really get into trouble, where 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 owners get into trouble, is that um, you can't always pick what it is that the dog right. becomes. Um, that what they link to, right? Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. yes, in theory, they're supposed to classically condition this tone, but they could also be looking at, for example, another dog when they get electrocuted, or they could be um, hearing a plane fly overhead when the shock occurs, or your girlfriend could walk into the yard at the time the shock happens. And now um, the plane the presence of another dog, the girlfriend, all elicit that that physiologic response, um, and they've been and they've been linked and classically conditioned. So yes, that can that can certainly happen, and um, and it's a real risk associated with using punishment in general, but um, but shock in particular. Yes. Yes. Um, so what do you? So now, if say you've got a dog who now. Um, we, we've had several, and it doesn't mean that it's just going to have one of these unfortunate circumstances. It could be that the dog is going <laughs> to sort of involve multiple problems here. So now right. I, I'm in the yard. I get shocked in the yard while I'm looking at the neighbor's dog who used to be my friend. Now, not only do I not want to go in the yard, but every time I see that dog, I react. And then that sort of trauma can become very pervasive. So maybe it's not just my neighbor's dog. Maybe it's any dog is going to make me shock. So right. do you see that there tends to be sort of layers to these problems that the dogs can exhibit? Sure. So, so that's a, a basic um, a concept in, in behavior that's called generalization or generalizing. And, and so the animal go, or the person for that matter goes from a very specific situation to, to the point where lots of things in the environment, you know, now trigger that, that response. And sure, we see it, we see it all the time. I mean, it's a, it's a frequent issue or problem. Anybody who uses punishment, any form of punishment has got to understand that there is fallout or consequences or a price, if you will, that has to be paid for, for using punishment. Um, one of which, honestly, is increased aggression directed towards the owner. Mm -hmm. And and consequently, because of that, um, it's a methodology that we just can't, we can't, uh, we can't recommend in good conscience. We just can't. Now, why do you say no. it's if, if the dog is now in the yard and it's being shocked when it looks at a dog or a cat or a squirrel, and so now it's reactive to that, and it doesn't mm -hmm. want to go in the yard, and so now I eliminate on the deck, why is the aggression being directed towards the owner if the owner is not necessarily as associated with the initial shock? Well, I, they can uh, associate the, the, the shock with the owner. And in fact, there was a, a really interesting study by a gentleman called Schalke in, uh, in Europe where he found that um, uh, military dogs... Uh, with whom that the, they had used uh, shock collar training, that those dogs um, not only responded obviously to the shock collar, but they also responded to being on the training ground. So in oh, other words, okay. they, they anticipated shock when they reached the training ground or showed shine, signs of distress. And it, it um, also generalized to their handlers. So they started showing signs and distress whenever they they went into working mode, anticipating mm -hmm. that they were going to be to be shocked. So in answer to your question about um, increased uh, aggression towards the owner, uh, there's two things that could happen. That generalization could occur where the owner is part and package of of that whole horrible experience, and also uh, when you're fearful, when you're worried. When you're you're anticipating that there's going to be a problem, it makes you more on edge. It makes you more aroused, and I don't mean that from a sexual standpoint, but rather from a physiologic standpoint. And then, consequently, you are more easily triggered or more likely to redirect your fear, anxiety, what have you, on whatever the nearest target might be. So, if a, a, a an owner were then to do something, for example, like reach suddenly for the dog and grab their collar, and the dog is fearful, in that in that instant they might well bite, 
where where normally they might not have done that, right? Because they're so worried, they're so on edge that that's just the final um, straw that breaks the camel's back. Oh. Right, and with when you add in the piece of we are developing some fears, perhaps of location or other things, the owners are right. more likely to interact with the dog in such a way that maybe helping in their mind or encouraging something else so the dog is frozen on the on the deck and not going into the yard and the owner's like well i'll just drag him down you know i'll just drag him down to the yard he'll see it's safe well you wouldn't ordinarily drag your dog into the yard but now that we've created this fear we're dragging a dog with good intentions but bad result the dog is in this fearful state more likely to get a bite or whatever that kind of thing adds a layer to it that we're now doing things we might not have otherwise done Right, interacting in a way that we we had yeah. prior wouldn't to have it. had to yeah, agreed. Right, yeah. and and I think sometimes owners don't really understand the level of either trauma, fear, distrust that is going on in their dog's mind. They just see their dog frozen on the porch. What they don't <laughs> know is what's going on underneath it. The level of fear and distrust and anxiety that their dog is feeling. So it, I think if they understood that, they might not do the, oh, come on, get down on the, you know, uh, come on down in the yard. Um, so there's this lack of, of understanding exactly what's going on. Because if your dog is frozen and he's not moving, that doesn't, what people don't understand, I think, oftentimes is that no behavior is not the same as good behavior. So mm. if your dog is not eliciting any behaviors, it probably means he's frozen in fear. This is not good behavior. This is no behavior. And uh, coming to an understanding of that, you might be a little bit more compassionate with your dog. But this lack of understanding of stress signals and the way in which fear may manifest itself can then have you, as well intended as you may be, exacerbate the situation. Absolutely. So, so there's two things that that I always tell tell my clients. One is. Um, the absence of behavior is just as important as the presence of behavior, right? So mm-hmm. an absence of behavior can be equally significant and, and, and should be taken as seriously as the presence of a behavior. That's one thing. And the other is back to your um, interpretation of, of, of the dog, um, we, it, it, it's a, a common human feeling. It's called attribution error, right? Where you inter- interpret everything through your own lens. And so what I see happening very, very frequently is people saying things, for example, you know, the dog is being stubborn. The dog deliberately ignored me. The dog uh, was um, was trying to get back at me. I mean, giving it giving ascribing all of these motives to the dog. That, that, you know, never, never right. uh, was part of the dog's re- repertoire, but is, it, it's part of the, of the person's interpretation of the situation. Um, and then co- to compound that is a lack of understanding of dog um, body language, right? right. They, they don't know what, what the dog is clearly signaling um, is, is, is a problem. And so often in consultations, I will spend a good part of the consultation saying, did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? Oh, again, did you see that? Um, and, 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 and the owners will often say, you know, I, ha- I had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't realize. I didn't know. And, and so you're right. You know, they, they just were not um, tuned in to the fact that this was uh, really a major a major suffering on the part of the, of the dog. I also think too, that owners sometimes take it really personally because they feel like, hold on a second here. I have now given you two acres within which you can romp and play and to your heart's content. And this is the way you do this. You now become aggressive to the neighbor's dog or you won't go off the fence. And I think they sometimes take this really personally that that's some mm. sort of offense to them, and which is when I point out to them, really I'm not thinking the dog is, you know, ungrateful um, in th- in that way. I think that what you need to understand is how unpleasant the shock was, so that he is incapable of enjoying what you have so graciously tried to provide to him, and that you need to understand yeah. that 
you know, as much as you tried to give him something he really wanted, the unintended consequence was that he's too afraid to use it because it hurts when he does. And when they understand right. that, then they feel really bad about installing the fence. And I'm like, you know, you did what you, you thought was best, so let's just go from here. But I think for those people who may be considering an electronic containment system, this is a really important podcast for them to, to listen to so they can understand what may happen if they do this. And the fact is that it doesn't really work. If it fails 50% of the time, that's not an effective containment system. If it fails 50% of the time, no. and then and then may cause your dog some really egregious behavioral problems, is it really worth it? You know, you have to ask yourself that question. So what is your advice to clients when they tell you, I just, I, I, you know, financially, this is a problem. Do you tell them to build the best fence they can afford, to use a tether and use supervision, to just walk their dog? What, what are the, what are the other things that we can suggest when we're saying, please, please, please don't bury a wire in your yard? I try and uh, do the, let's make lemonade out of lemons kind of, kind of approach. <laughs> And go well. I guess you're gonna uh, be embarking on a on a really awesome fitness program because, <laughs> because you know your dog needs to get out and about, and uh, you know you've got limitations. You know, here are some suggestions for for playing and working with your dog inside. Here are you know your rainy day options. Here are some various locations in your geographic area where you can probably take your dog in off hours and, and or be, be able to give them more exercise. You know, we start going down down the list of, of other alternatives and other options. But um, I don't necessarily let people, you know, wiggle off that hook because the bottom line is, is, is that they, they have this dog, right? They committed mm -hmm. to this dog. And as a living entity, the dog has certain requirements, you know, for exercise, for diet, for medical care. And that's part and parcel of, of owning the dog. Mm -hmm. if, if they feel like it is too much for them to do, then we need to have an honest discussion about maybe then their home isn't the best place for that dog and, and talk about rehoming um, to a more suitable home. Yeah. And, and that's a really hard conversation to have. Um, yes. But you have to think about the welfare, and the welfare of the family as well, because if the dog is that stressed, then the family's not going to be happy either. I mean, this is sort of a, a total picture. So, yeah, you got to do what's best for the dog. And oftentimes, if not most of the time, I find what if I'm doing right by the family, I'm doing right by the dog and vice versa. So, um, Exactly. Agreed. I have um, one client, for example, he really doesn't like the electronic fence, but where his house is situated on a busy road, he feels, and he's got teenage kids that are coming and going all the time so the doors get open and closed and the dog can slip out, and he feels very strongly that he doesn't have any other options on a busy road to keep his dog back. So what would you say to somebody like that who really feels like they need to have that extra level of protection? Well, I mean, I, I would point out to him that, that it isn't necessarily another layer of safety, right? If it's a 50 car coin toss, that's not, that's not a whole lot of safety. Um, sometimes talk to them about uh, dividing the household up so that there's a, safe, a dog side of the household and a, a people side of the household so that okay. escape is less likely. Um, with a lot of my clients, we talk about establishing a what we jokingly call a DMZ zone, so a demilitarized <laughs> zone, uh, around the front door with a, an X pen or something like that, so that again there's another layer uh, right. between escape and the and the front door. Um, so those are all you know potential options. But I, I would I think the main thing that I would point out is is that um, it just the level of success with the invisible systems is just not high enough for anybody to be fooled into thinking that that's going to be the, the saving grace in an escape, right. especially they a dog that chases cars or that goes after other dogs. You know, when they, many dogs will take that hit um, and, and not blink an eye if they're chasing something. Right. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to take the hit to come back. 
they're not after they've calmed oh, down no. and chased this car, chased this dog. Okay. They're not going to then take the hit to come back home. Yeah, no. and and right. they're also not just not going to no, sit. No, no, no. no. Yeah, and they're also not just going to sit quietly on the other side of it, waiting for somebody to come and let me in. For somebody to show up, for right. them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're right. There is a can we danger can there. can we go forward yeah. and talk? I want to make sure we fit in the actual remote controlled shocks as well, because yes. that is. Ah. The magic wand that everyone's looking for, and it seems so attractive. So um, you had mentioned before that many franchises sort of include that as a part of their package. Here, we give you this shock collar and a remote control, and we teach you how to use it, and your dog will magically have no behavior ever again. Um, Obviously, that was a little bit of sarcasm on my part because I, I don't think these are great tools. But can you tell us a little bit about how you see them most commonly used and misused? The main place I see them being used, at least in our area, is for dogs that are uh, aggressive or reactive towards other dogs. Mm -hmm. And basically, the dog is shocked whenever it shows any form of aggression. Um, And what I try (laughs) to explain to people is that the dog is being shocked for giving warning signals and signs that they are that it's causing behavioral suppression but it's not doing anything about underlying motivation in other words right. the reason why the most dogs are reactive is because they're afraid or they're worried and now on top of all of that they're also being shocked every time the worrisome thing um, is is present and what is going to happen at some point or time is that people are going to think that behavioral suppression, that is lack of barking, means that the dog is quote unquote fine mm-hmm. with the presence of other dogs. And that is yeah. not what is going on. And uh, it is setting up everyone for a, an, eminent, um, an eminent disaster, potentially. Yeah, and yeah. D- doing nothing, nothing to help the dog emotionally or or behaviorally through behavior modification to figure out a better way to handle or deal with the situation that they find so disturbing. It's like that old threat of like, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, like, well, well, uh. yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, you're afraid of that dog. I'll make you even more afraid. Yay. Um, it, well, it's a also- real tough. I was just going to say too is is um, at least in my experience it's been is if you punish a dog and you punish it enough to stop the behavior so you stop the growling you stop the snarling whatever and you suppress that behavior it doesn't stay suppressed and that when it comes out it doesn't come out and bob gently to the surface it tends to come <laughs> out with fury um and would do you find that to be true as well that if you suppress and you suppress and you suppress and you suppress when it comes out it just comes out like a torrent yeah potentially so and that's what i was uh, was saying is just you know you're setting setting uh, folks up for disaster because they they are under the impression that that because the behavior has been suppressed that the dog is now okay or fine with it which means that now they are they are less likely to take safeguards or uh, use appropriate management or you know avoidance you know that kind of stuff and, and mm-hmm. instead of throwing the dog into the middle of a situation where they continue to feel uncomfortable and so yes potentially then the repercussions could be really bad uh, right um, very bad well the other or thing is the, the, go ahead Colleen or even it doesn't necessarily have to be an explosion of aggression, but it could become that the dog is, you know, obsessively licking their leg, you know, that the stress or that, you know, other behaviors, all this tension and anxiety, yeah. it has to be yeah. manifested somehow. And if it cannot be manifested uh-huh. by barking, it's still going to come out, you know, so you could wind up with peeing behind your couch because you have corrected your dog for barking at the neighbor. Hmm. doesn't seem like those are related. And yet... They may well be. Yes, Abs- absolutely. And, you know, think about the welfare implications as well. I mean, you know, anti-bark collars are another example, right, of an mm-hmm. electronic device that's used to suppress behavior. 
So every time the dog barks, he's getting shocked. But no one's bothered to answer the question about why is the dog barking in the first place? You know, he's barking because he's um, in social isolation and distress because he's got severe separation anxiety. And now on top of that, he's getting he's getting zapped for actually vocalizing and verbalizing, if you will, his his fear and anxiety i mean think about the quality of that dog's life i mean there is no quality of life uh, in that situation and just because the dog is not barking now does not mean that the dog is fine right Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's just really heartbreaking the misunderstanding that goes along with using that methodology um as a means of 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 affecting behavior i won't even say modifying it because i think that's giving it too much (laughs) <laughs> yeah. so, so so many people say, but I don't do a very high shock. I do just a, I, it's a really low, it's a tiny little shock. So it must be okay. I, you know, I'm not hurting my dog. What do you say in response to that? So, so that's a, it's a real uh, problem. And, and I've had actually had clients like break down in tears when I, I start uh, pointing this out to them. So I say to them, well, if it's not, if it, if it doesn't hurt them, if it doesn't, if they can't feel it, then why, why has it stopped the behavior? And they're like, well, it just, it just stimulates them. I said, well, okay. So, so why doesn't the dog stop the behavior when you say no? Or why doesn't the dog stop the behavior when you, um, a call to him. I mean, that's just distracting him. That's just a, a, a minor stimulation. Why is it that the collar is 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 working? It's because it hurts. That's why the collar is 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 working, and it's not doing anything again about the underlying motivation. It just hurts so bad that the dog's afraid. And I mean, I just I yeah, it, I just don't understand sometimes why um, people, well, I do understand. We all want the quick fix, right? We do. We all want the easy road. Mm -hmm. We all want the problem to go away. We all want um, uh, things to meet our expectations. In this case, the dog to meet whatever expectations, you know, I have in my head about how the dog should behave uh, because that's the way I want it to be, right? Never Mm -hmm. mind all the work and the fact that the animal's an individual and, and all the other considerations that go into it. And, well, and um, all the marketing presents it as gentle and humane and, you know, especially like all the invisible fence signs are all like a happy yes. dog. The life is grand and peace yes. of mind. And so people with really good intentions are looking toward these tools as ways to, to get what they, to get what they want, you know, which is happy dog, yes. easy life um, without, without even knowing honestly all the risks involved so it's not that they're consciously seeing the risk and blowing right past them they're being told something entirely untrue this is safe this is effective this is guaranteed and then they find out oh great yeah (laughs) maybe maybe not so good yeah and Mm -hmm. and in their defense if you if you go and you do an internet search um it's going to be those commercial brands and those commercial franchises that pop up first because they're the ones who do, you know, all the search engine optimization. They're the ones that go out and buy the 200 name domains. They're the ones who, who do all that heavy duty advertising. And honestly, that's an area where those of us who have um, a little bit more training and background uh, have fallen short in that um, we don't get that message up there uh, front and center as well as uh, the commercial ventures do, unfortunately. Right. The other thing I was going to mention, too, is that some people will say, well, okay, I don't use a shock collar, but I use a citronella collar to stop barking. Mm. And mm-hmm. it's, you're right. That's not the same thing as shocking your dog. But I think the s- ramifications can be very much the same, same way. It can be very, I think, disturbing or frightening to a dog. That whenever it barks, have something sprayed in its face. Um, it may not have quite the same deleterious results as... A, a shot collar, but I'm not sure that it's really an improvement on changing an animal's behavior because you're not, once again, addressing the underlying cause of the behavior. And have you had, I just was kind of curious what you thought of the citronella collars. 
uh, versus a shock collar or just citronella, uh, citronella collars in general? How about all of the above? It's all of the above. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's another aversive, right? Right. I mean, that is how it works. It is aversive, meaning the dogs don't like it. And so, yeah, so all the things that we've discussed still apply. You know, you're not doing anything about underlying motivation. The only way that it works is if the animal finds it to be unpleasant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and you're suppressing behavior without um, doing anything to, to understand why the dog is doing it or to help the dog um, overcome whatever situation it is. That and then if the dog do doesn't it find it to be adversive, it's not going to work. So the next step would be to go to a shock collar is what I have found. Yes. So that's, that's a common approach, right? That is, is that you then escalate, right? You, right. you keep go bumping it up a notch and bumping it up a notch. And there was a really uh, interesting study done in pigeons, you know, bar- back in the dark ages when they were, were just uh, uh, doing the straight operant conditioning, you know, Skinner's, Skinner's period. And they found that um, they could uh, stop pigeons from pecking at a key for food with a relatively small uh, shock, about 30 volts, if it was done at 30 volts from the get-go. So, in other words, boom, you hit them with the 30 volts and they they would stop the pecking. Uh, What they also discovered is that if they incrementally raised the voltage over time, that the Pigeons wouldn't stop pecking until they hit about 300, 300. Oh, my. Oh, my. So so they habituate over time. In other words, they put up with it over time. Uh um, And and you end up using harsher and harsher and harsher Mm -hmm. methods. So escalation is really common uh, with punishment when it's improperly applied. And it is a, a major, it's a major wealth, again, major welfare uh, concern. That's when you start getting right. into the, you know, burns and all that kind of stuff on the neck. And I it just, um, yeah, none of yeah. us need yeah. to go there. No, yeah. we don't. Well, I, I don't know about Colleen, but I know that, that I have lost clients when I've had, they've adopted a dog who has some interesting issues, may, you know, pull really hard, plays too rough, escalates very quickly. Um, you know, just a high energy dog, um, and they're having problems trying to manage his behavior. And he goes, qu- he escalates quickly from just playing to biting and playing. And you know, working with me, we're talking about you know behavior modification and you know, you know, cutting off play when he gets too you know too quickly and so on and so forth. And they get frustrated with with the fact that this goes slowly, yep. and then they dump me and go to somebody yes. with a shock collar. And, right. uh, you know, I right. just, it's very frustrating for me and it, it just breaks my heart because I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Modifying behavior in a humane way may take some time. It just does. Yep. Um, yep. But you're going to, in the, in the long run, you're probably going to have a happier, healthy, more engaged dog. Understand wanting the quick fix, but I have a feeling that within a year, that dog's going to be out of your household now anyway because you just. Right. You're going to suppress the behavior and then either that or you're going to drive the dog to even greater aggression. And then we've yeah. lost the dog. And that's just really heartbreaking. Hopefully um, people will will consider, reconsider, right, before adopting right. This, these, uh, these methodologies. Um, there's a reason why those of us who do this for a living uh, tend to shy, shy away from them. Um, the use of punishment because uh, it it really has very very um, limited application. It is a welfare issue and um, it's hard to do it. It's hard to do it right or do it effectively, and so we just don't recommend it. Um, and you know, really, is that the kind of relationship that you want with your dog? Yeah. Um, yeah. One one of, of punishment and 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 uh, suppression and subjugation, or are you looking for someone who's uh, a companion? Are you looking to build, you know, trust and um, responsiveness and cooperation and um, a willingness, you know, to to uh, interact with you? And well, I, I wonder. I, I pick the latter. 
Yeah, I, I think too. Colleen and I do too. But I also <laughs> wonder too if, if the rise of some of this doesn't come with the this uh, uh, inability to kill this idea of dominance. You know, the dominance theory of, of interaction with your dog. So that if you feel like I have to be the pack leader, I have to be the dominant alpha of the of my pack. Well, then it makes perfect sense that I need to use some force to instill my domination. And I think that, that unfortunately, that view of dogs and that view of dog training opens up the door to a lot more punishment than if you viewed, if you didn't view dogs as something that needed to be dominated or subjugated, as you said. But yeah. that, that's a whole other discussion. I was wondering if there's any articles or links um, that you would like us to put on the, the website uh, for our show notes that people may go to if they want more information on any of the things that we've talked about. If you could give us some of those articles and links, we'll make sure we get those. And um, if somebody, especially in Virginia, would like your services, is there a good way for them to contact you? Uh, the best way to reach me is actually through my website which is um, behaviorsolutions.guru, so behaviorsolutions, plural, dot mm-hmm. G-U-R-U. Okay. And all of the information um, is, on that, is on that website. And right. then I'm happy to share links with you. Um, I would just as an add-on say um, many of your listeners may not be aware that in many countries in Europe, um, electronic shock collars are illegal or banned. Mm-hmm. Um, the United States, gotta, gotta love us, uh, is one of the few countries where you can just go and, and, and buy one at the local, you know, yeah. uh, uh, agricultural supply store or, or sporting goods store. So mm-hmm. uh, there's a reason why they're banned <laughs> in other countries, and we should um, consider and look at that evidence very carefully. I agree. I agree, too. In fact, I just wrote a letter or an email to L.L. Bean, who offers um, shock collars and containment systems. And um, I had written a a blog on electric fences and just wrote them an email and said, um, you know, you might want to reconsider offering these systems. Um, Here are some links. Here's some things to take a look at, some articles that you can take a look at. We'll, We'll put my blog up on the show notes as well. Um, Because if we're truly about um, building a relationship with man's best friend, is this the way in which we want to promote that kind of relationship? And I got an email back saying, we are forwarding this to the appropriate division. But I haven't heard from the appropriate (laughs) division yet. So I'm not sure. I'm sure the appropriate (laughs) division is calculating the numbers right now to see if it's financially wise to listen to your wise advice. That's right. But I kind of feel like if we don't take a stand and and challenge people to take Mm -hmm. a second look at these things, I didn't say I would never shop there again. I didn't, you know, threaten everything. I just said, could you please take a step back and consider what the consequences of these systems are? And is this really what you want to promote? And um, because if we don't take a stand, those of us who know better and know what the consequences are, then how are we going to get the general public to change? Yeah. So, Agreed. Absolutely. And far too often we're going to be seeing clients after they've already tried it, which yes. is much harder yes. than seeing them before they've tried it. Um, so it's always horrible to lose a client who then goes to a shock color, but it's really no treat to get a client after they've had the horrible experience and realized that didn't right. work for them and then say, Oh, let's try to undo some of that. Right. Yep. Agreed. Right. Well, Good. thank you very much, Dr. Sin. This was very enlightening and I really appreciate you spending this much time uh, talking with us about this. Uh, yeah, Colleen, very do, you have any other, do you have any other questions for Dr. Sin? No, just want to thank her for helping us. Yes, this is terrific. Thank you so much. It's been great. You're very welcome. It's much pleasure, ladies. Thanks for listening to your family dog. Got questions? Interesting ideas? Colleen and Julie would love to hear them. Call 614-349-1661 or visit www.yourfamilydogpodcast.com to share your thoughts.